about this general class of methods called line by line methods. All right, ADI is just a subset of that. So, so far we've used pointwise iterations. In these methods, the computational domain was swept through one point at a time. Okay. Um, in a structured mesh, however, we have constant i and j lines. So, we can make use of that. All right. So, we can sweep through the domain such that, so if you have a bunch of rows and a bunch of columns, you can think of it as sweeping, you know, starting from the bottom, let's say you go 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way up to M, and then starting from the left, you go 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way up to N. All right? <clears throat> so, that's the basic idea that you start. So, here, of course, in this picture, I'm assuming that uh, we have Dirichlet boundary conditions at the bottom, so we are not going to solve for the bottom nodes. We're going to start from the second row of nodes right here, okay? And then we move up that way uh, one node at a time, or sorry, one line at a time, okay? So, all these nodes that I have here, I'm going to solve for simultaneously, not one at a time, okay? But that still doesn't give me the solution of the whole domain because that's just only part of the whole domain. So then I am going to move and do that again for these guys and so on and move up. Okay? That's the basic idea of a line by line sweep. So we keep moving up, repeat for each line. All right? So in terms of the steps, we start with step number one, which is the same as in the other two methods. You start with the guess for all the fee values, okay? Then in step two, what we do is we rewrite the governing equation in a new way, okay? So, for example, our governing equation has I, it has this term here, it has I plus one, <coughs> has that, it has i minus 1, j plus 1, and j minus 1. Five terms. What I've done here is I have transposed two of those terms over to the right-hand side. Now, if you think about your stencil, okay, here is what it looks like. We have nodes here, 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 and here, okay? And, of course, we have one at the center. For some reason, my writer is writing in a spot different from where I'm writing, okay? So, sorry about that. Uh, so, what I've done here is, because I'm going to do a row-wise sweep, all these terms I have kept on the left-hand side of the equation, and that's what you see here on the left. I have the I minus 1, the I plus 1, and the I, which are these three nodes, okay? The other two terms, that's this guy and that guy, I have transposed over to the right-hand side of the equation, okay? So I'm going to solve for that one row, so everything outside of this row is still an unknown to me, okay? And I'm going to pretend that they are knowns. Why? Because I, I'm, I can always use my guessed values for those, okay? Now, here's the other thing. If you are doing a bottom-to-top sweep, then by the time you get to this node, okay, or this line, let's say, this node has already been solved for because you're moving bottom to top. So that is why the J minus 1 here is not denoted by a star because it still has a current value. The only term that does not have a current value is the J plus 1, which is the northern node to the top, okay, because I haven't solved for that row yet, okay. This would be true only if you're doing a bottom to top sweep. If you're doing a top to bottom sweep, then the j plus 1 would be known, the j minus 1 would be known, uh, would be unknown, okay? Either way, you will have one term on the right-hand side, which would be an updated value, and, and the second term would have a guessed value, okay? Now, really, the reason we want to do this line-by-line -line sweep is because we can use a tridiagonal solver, which you all saw in homework one is very easy to set up and use. If I have those five bands and two of them are spaced far apart, I can't use a tridiagonal solver. So what am I doing? I'm taking those two far away diagonals, throwing them to the right hand side of the equation, so I still have a tridiagonal solver. Okay? But of course that doesn't give me the solution to the actual set of equations. It gives me a, an approximation to the actual solution. Okay? 
and so you have to still iterate. But that's the basic idea. We are making use of the fact that triagonal solvers are very easy to set up, they're very cheap, okay, to, uh, in terms of computational time. Oops. So in step three, so what we are doing here is we are going all the way row wise from bottom to top, okay, through all the rows and then when I've covered all the rows, that completes one sweep of the computational domain and as I said, that counts for one iteration, okay. So therefore, I'm ready to calculate my residual, okay, and check for convergence. The residual is exactly the same as what you had in your Gauss-Seidel method, in your Jacobi method. It's the finite difference equation with all the terms pulled to one side, squared and added, and then square root, okay. Uh, in fact, what you should always do is, if you have written that for your Jacobi method, let's say that's your first homework, you should ju just cut and paste that into all your other homeworks, not change the way it is done at all. So no matter what method you're using for your for solving your algebraic equations, the residual definition remains the same and that's the same definition you need to use all the time, okay? So that's my residual and I check for convergence and of course then we repeat, um, actually again this should be steps two and three, okay? until convergence. One is just the guess, so we don't want to use one again. It's just two and three, okay? So that's the idea. In instead of sweeping through individual nodes, we just do it line by line. So these are called line by line methods. Now, can anyone say what might be a disadvantage of the method? one? Well, the disadvantage is you can use it only for a structured mesh, okay? You have an unstructured mesh, you can't use this. So that's the problem, all right? Whereas the point-wise methods we talked about before, you can use it for any mesh topology because you're just moving from one point to another, okay? It doesn't care about how those points are arranged. Okay, so that's one of the problems with this method, um, but every uh, structured mesh code that's out there, in some form or the other, uses these kinds of line-by-line -line methods, okay? because they're so cheap, so easy to program in, no matter how complicated the problem, okay? <clears throat> so some of the features of the line-by-line -line method is you need to store only one set of values for phi. This is the same as the Gauss-Seidel method. Again, your whatever value of array of numbers you have for phi, they simply get updated with the newest values and that's what you use, okay? You don't have to worry about previous iteration values. Um, the method is one point explicit. So now we have increased further in implicitness. Remember in Jacobi, we had four surrounding nodes which were explicit. In Gauss-Seidel, we had this guy and that guy as explicit. Now we have improved the implicitness even further, only one point here is explicit, okay? <coughs> so we are going more and more towards a scenario where we are actually treating all the nodes implicitly, okay? Um, here is the disadvantage that I talked about. Since it's a line-wise method, it can only be used for structured meshes where we have ordered i and j lines and in 3D i, j, k lines, okay? <coughs> Now, for boundary value problems to converge efficiently, the information from the boundary must propagate into the computational domain. So one of the things that happens is when you do a line-by-line -line approach like this, okay, you get back to this figure. So what are we doing? We are solving, let's say, for the entire row, all those nodes simultaneously. So what that means is that Whatever boundary condition I have here on the left side and here on the right side, they immediately affect all these nodes right after I do the tridiagonal solution. Everything is affected, right? Because all those values are updated in one shot. 
So what that means is, if I have a boundary condition of 0 here, let's say, okay, and 1 here, you will see all these numbers will get values between 0 and 1, okay, which means both boundaries effects have been immediately felt within the computational domain. On the flip side, if you did Gauss-Seidel iteration, okay, and you're moving from left to right that way, when you solve for solve for this node, let's say, you see only the effect of the left node. You don't see the effect of the right node because the right node still has a guessed value. Okay? So it takes a lot of iterations before the right boundary condition information will propagate into your solution. Okay, same thing for the top boundary node. If you're doing bottom to bottom to top and left to right sweeps, okay. If you're doing the opposite, then uh, the left and bottom boundaries will not be felt immediately. Okay, so that is one of the issues. Again, this is you know physical arguments as to why this method works faster. Basically, the information propagates through the computational domain very quickly, at least in one direction. Now, in the other direction, you still have that problem because the northern node is explicitly treated, which means the top boundary condition is not felt at all, okay, unless you've done a lot of iterations. The first time you solve it, for example, the top boundary condition information is not in your solution at all. So uh, one of the problems that people have often found is that depending on the problem. So I can design a problem where just row-wise sweeps will work fantastic, okay? Or I can have a problem where column-wise sweeps will work fantastic. In general, it's very hard to say which one would be preferable, okay? Because when you're developing a code, you often, you know, want to develop a code that may be applied to, let's say you're doing solution in a rectangular domain. The rectangle may have different aspect ratios, okay? Depending on what aspect ratio it has, row-wise sweeps may be better or column-wise sweeps may be better, okay? So to avoid those kinds of uh, controver con controversies, you know, what people have done is that <clears throat> they've come up with this scheme where first iteration, let's say you do row-wise sweeps, second iteration you're going to do column-wise sweeps, third iteration row-wise, then column-wise, and so on. Okay, so that's why it's known as the alternating direction implicit method. Alternating direction is pretty obvious. Implicit because you're solving for all the nodes in one shot. Okay, it has this implicitness in it. All right. Some people even go to the extent of doing bottom to top, left to right, followed by top to bottom, right to left. You know, all those kinds of games they would play. And to some extent, it's still problem dependent, okay, the convergence. But that's what the ADI algorithm does. I will show you some examples of what happens when you do alternating directions versus just row wise and so on, okay. I'll show you some examples of convergence. But <clears throat> let's go over the algorithm first, okay. Any questions so far? It's a pretty straightforward concept. so. So step two basically gets broken into steps, let's say 2A and 2B, okay? You can also call it 2R and 2C, meaning two for row and two for column, okay? So here we are doing a bottom to top sweep, all right? And you can see this is the row wise sweep equation that I had earlier. Now, after I've done that, I'm going to do basically a column wise sweep where you can see the i minus 1 and i plus 1, I have transposed over to the right-hand side of the equation, okay? So when I go to the column-wise sweep, I'm still going to use all the updated solution from this sweep, okay? <clears throat> so this star that you have here, this is really the, not the complete old guess, but this is really the old value that you get after solving this part here, okay? So keep that in mind. It's not, you know, the complete old sweep before the row wise sweep. It's the old as in after the row wise sweep, before the column wise sweep. All right? So that's the idea. You're doing bottom to top followed by left to right. <clears throat> Two tridiagonal solves. 
Okay. Uh, as I said, it is customary to count one row-wise sweep through the computational domain and one column-wise sweep through the computational domain as two iterations because the number of iterations we define as one complete sweep through all the nodes is one iteration. Okay, here of course you're doing row-wise, that's one sweep, and then column-wise, which is another sweep. So that's two iterations. So when you write out your residuals, you know, if you're writing it out only after one, one row and one column, make sure you increment the iteration number by two instead of one. Okay? Uh, residuals are usually calculated after both sweeps. So by that I mean after both sweeps are over, okay? not. Typically, people don't calculate it after just one row sweep and then again after a column sweep, okay? I mean, you can do that. It's just something that uh, is avoided because residual calculations also take time, okay? <clears throat> so then you calculate your residual and you check for your convergence and you repeat steps two through three again. That's the basic idea. Mm -hmm. Any questions? All right. Uh, here's a little pseudocode that I wanted to share with you to see how it's done, okay? You can see how short it is. So uh, one of the things I mentioned is uh, that you should write a tridiagonal solver, okay? It should be modular, and this is the reason. If you don't write it in as a modular form, then you know you are basically have repeating that same big chunk of code every time you use a tridiagonal solver, and it, it makes the program unnecessarily long and you know prone to errors. So this function here, okay, it could be a function or a subroutine or procedure, whatever depends on the language you are using. Essentially, this is a tridiagonal solver. All it is doing is I'm saying, okay, here's the number of equations I want to solve. Here is my A, D, C, those three diagonals, okay. B is the right-hand side vector, and phi x is my solution, okay. So you should write it in that form, that you just feed in the number of equations and those three diagonals, and it spits on and the right hand side, and it spits out for you the vector of phi. Okay. Okay. So we'll get to that in a moment. So here, what am I doing here? First thing I'm doing is I'm resetting the a, b, c, and d in the tridiagonal matrix, all of them to zero. Okay. That way, anything that is a non-zero, uh, you know, not overwritten, just stays as zero. For example. You know, we, we looked at these matrices where I have a 1 in the diagonal and a 0 right next to it. That 0 is basically C1, okay, according to our nomenclature. So if I filled in the C with zeros already, I don't need to write additional code to say C1 is equal to 0, okay? So that's the idea. So. You see here, um, so for our tridiagonal solve, this is this code that I have, this is for Dirichlet boundary conditions. We are assuming mm -hmm. that the two values at the ends are known, okay? So that's why I have a one in the diagonal for the first node, okay? And then one in the diagonal for the last node, okay? Phi left as the right-hand side vector for the first node phi right for the right hand side vector for the last node. This is exactly what you did in your homework, okay, no different. And then my, here is my diagonal, okay, here is my um, west contribution, here is my east contribution, <coughs> okay, negative 2 over delta x square, uh, or sorry, negative 1 over delta x square, and then this is my right hand side vector. This one here is a little bit different. In the sense, it has <coughs> this source term, okay, and it has these two terms that I transposed over, j plus 1 and j minus 1, okay? This is the only difference between the one-dimensional code that you wrote for your homework one and setting it up in ADI form, all right? Now, notice that this is your tridiagonal solve that you're setting up, up to here, okay? But you're now putting that within a loop. 
j going from row number 2 to row number m minus 1. Again, I am assuming Dirichlet boundary conditions on the bottom and top rows, so I do not have to solve for those two. Okay, so I am going from 2 to m minus 1. All right. So the whole tridiagonal solve that you guys have developed for homework 1, this is basically this chunk. All you do is you put a loop around it and make sure you do this modification here. Okay, and that's it. That's pretty much your ADI solver. Okay, and then after you come out of the solver, you make sure that you copy that local solution of that one row into your fee matrix. Okay, so you see I have colon comma j, so j will be two when it goes through it the first time. So phi of all the numbers of that particular row will get updated. Okay, now why do I need that? Well, by the time I do j equal to 2, I need updated values here. So I must update my phi array of numbers so that it keeps using the updated values. Okay? Everybody got that? Any questions? That's delta y square. So that so this is for a row wise sweep, okay? As you see here. Yeah. Column wise sweep you will have the same chunk of code except you will have i going from two to n minus one, and then all these will be set up in terms of j instead of i. Okay? <coughs> Oh, okay. That's that's just the difference between uh, a subroutine and a function. Okay, so this is a subroutine. You could also write it as a function where you say, "I'm having a hard time writing here." You could say, "Phi x is equal to some function." Okay, that way the the, the phi x is the output. Okay, so that's a procedural thing. It depends on the programming language you're using. So it's, still your output. it's still my output. Yes. <laughs> yeah, sure. Sure, you can do that. I, I just didn't do that here because this is something I just wrote for explaining to you guys. But yeah, you're absolutely, uh, you know, in fact, you should calculate these coefficients outside of the loop and just use them. Okay? Typically, I would call them A naught, A east, A west, A south, A north, okay, outside of the loop. And then I would simply say dx of i is equal to A naught. Okay, and so on. So, yeah, here I did it he uh, this way so that you know what I'm talking about. Any other questions? All right. So let's uh, move on then, and Now this, uh, I'll show you some examples right after I talk about this. So one of the points, and this is a common mistake I, I see some students make, so I want to point this out, okay? Uh, we are doing these iterative solutions for two reasons. One is that Gauss-Seidel, as we said, the matrix, if we fill in the full matrix, it takes a lot of memory, okay? Because it's K square, all right? That's one reason. The second reason is that Gauss, Ga, uh, Gaussian elimination is inefficient when we get to large K. But let's think about the first one. The first one is that we have this matrix A, which takes a lot of, excuse me, a lot of memory. Okay? Now, sometimes what I find students do is they pretend as if they are going to do a matrix inversion and they fill in the matrix A and then they will go in and say D of I is equal to A I comma I. Okay, so they fill in this big matrix A first and then they'll say D I is equal to A I comma Y, uh, I comma I, C I is equal to A I comma I plus one and A I is equal to A I comma I minus one. The moment you do that, you have defeated the purpose of saving memory because 
whenever the moment you write that command a is equal to zeros of k comma k you've already allocated memory for that humongous mat matrix okay so do not ever fill in that a matrix that defeats the purpose of doing an iterative solver okay you already know where, where your non zero elements are where they're located in the matrix and you use that knowledge to fill in the matrices that you need for the tridiagonal solver directly okay or whatever you need for uh, you know the gauss seidel and jacobi method where matrix notations are not even needed okay but do not fill in an a matrix and then use that a matrix for running your algorithm that just you know immediately takes up a lot of memory unnecessarily okay i mean conceptually it's the same thing you are still doing the same calculation but you have defeated the purpose of saving memory okay so that's what i wanted to mention here that do not allocate the a, a, a matrix at all ever okay all right let me show you let me um let me um just go out of this and show you some examples So here is an example, um, let's see, I'll try to make this a little bigger, let's try 125, yeah, that should work, okay. So this is a problem where we are solving a Poisson equation on a square computational domain with Dirichlet boundary conditions on all sides, okay. This is the kind of problem that we've been talking about. All right, and you can see here, so different mesh sizes I've used, okay? So if I use an 81 by 81 mesh, okay, oops, here, and do either a row-wise sweep or a column-wise sweep, for this particular problem, we get identical convergence, okay? You can't even distinguish between the two lines. And the reason for that is when you have equal grid spacing and you have a square domain, your coefficients in the x direction and y direction, they're identical. 1 over delta x square is the same as 1 over delta y square. Okay? So it's almost as if you have flipped the problem around and solving the same problem by making x, y, and y, x. Okay? That's all you're doing. So there is no difference at all in terms of convergence. You start noticing differences in convergence when you make your delta x and delta y different. Okay, so that can be that can happen because of two reasons. One is let's say you use different number of grid points in the two different directions. Okay, so your ratio of delta x to delta y is different, or maybe you have a long pipe, okay, with a short height, and so even if you use equal grid spacing in the two directions, the number of grid points are very different. Okay. Either way, your matrix is now going to get skewed. The X and Y uh, relationship will go away. All right. And that's where you start seeing huge differences. So notice that when I use row wise sweeps, so now I have a 41 oops, times 81 mesh. 41 in the X direction, 81 in the Y direction. So the mesh is coarse in the X direction. Okay, and notice that the row-wise sweep actually takes much longer than the column-wise sweep. Okay, so in the in the vertical direction where I have really fine mesh, okay, uh, basically what it is saying is you need to be because your mesh is fine in the vertical direction, 81 nodes, you need to be implicit in that direction. What does that mean? That means I want to do tridiagonal solves column-wise. Okay. If it was the other way around, if my mesh was fine in the x direction, then what you would see is it would say you are better off being implicit in the fine mesh direction because the fine mesh is the harder one to converge in general. Okay, the coarse mesh is easier to converge, and this has to do with you know the eigenvalues of the matrix and so on, which we will talk about later on when we talk about stability and convergence. But that's basically what it is saying that if I have a computational domain like that, okay. 
and the mesh is really fine in that direction, then I want to do implicit solution in that direction, okay? Which would mean I want to do column-wise sweeps. It's preferable over row-wise sweeps, okay? Another way of thinking of it is if I do implicit solution in that direction, the information propagates instantaneously across that computational domain, okay? But think about it. If I instead did explicit calculation in that direction, it would take, because there are 81 grid points, it would take me a lot more iterations to actually propagate that information through 81 nodes than it would take for 41 nodes in the other direction, okay? So everybody get this? So this has to do with, you know, uh, how the problem is set up. So for fluid flow problems, for example, when we do, let's say, flow in a pipe, okay? What people typically find is that because the interplay between the inlet and outlet boundary conditions are, is very important in determining the actual pressure drop in the pipe, okay, you're much better off doing implicit calculation in the x direction, along the direction of the flow, okay, from the direction connecting inlet and outlet, rather than from wall to wall, okay? So it's very much problem dependent. It depends on the aspect ratio. It essentially, which way it will converge, which way will be faster depends on what the elements of your matrix are. Uh, let me show you what happens if you now do ADI for this same problem, okay? I mean, it's not hard to guess what will happen. This is what you will get. Okay? you will get a performance which is somewhere in between the row-wise and column-wise sweeps, okay? <clears throat> which is understandable. Now, what this means is that if I did column-wise sweeps only uh, versus I do ADI, I have wasted a few iterations by doing ADI. It, the fact that I did some row-wise sweeps really didn't help the convergence that much. Okay, it's really the column-wise sweeps that matter. That's what this is telling us. But in a given problem, you would often know that that would be the case. For a square domain like that, it's easy to figure out, especially when, you know, the only thing that's changing is the delta x and delta y. But in general, that's a little more difficult to figure out, and that's why people go with ADI as the default option instead of trying to figure out which way would be better, row-wise or column-wise. But if you're writing a code for a very specific application that, let's say for your research, that the code is only geared towards that, then yeah, maybe you can do some numerical experiments and figure out, okay, for, for my particular application, for my code, row-wise sweeps is the way to go. Okay? Any questions? Now here I'm showing actually, um, you know, well, this is not really, um, I, I think I'm trying to make a different point there, so let's not talk about it. But one thing you do see here is how ADI scales with number of iterations, uh, with number of mesh points, okay? And this is something you will see in all your homeworks, and this is what I was talking about, is the holy grail of iterative methods. What is this number versus that number, and this number versus that number? What are the ratios? In this case, it's approximately four, you'll find.